Well, thanks for joining us. We're doing a little three-part series this week on what God would want for Father's Day. So let's jump right in with the first part. For the last 41 years or so, right about the time school is out, my wife, Kitsy, asks me what I want for Father's Day. Sometimes I'll ask for tickets to a Royals baseball game so that we can take our whole family with us because what I really want for Father's Day is to be with my whole family. Now, I like to be with my family and I like to tell other people about my kids. So I thought about today just showing you pictures of my family and telling you about it. But you probably wouldn't be that interested. And actually, as I prayed and asked our Heavenly Father, I call him Papa, what he wanted for Father's Day, he said he likes the same thing I do. He likes to be with his kids and he likes to tell us, tell everybody about his first son, Jesus. And especially tell us what Jesus did for us, because that's actually what makes it possible for God to be with all of us, not only Father's Day, but each and every day. So even though I love it when I'm with all three of my kids at the same time, I don't get to do that very often. And it's fun just for me to be with each one of them individually. But God, our Heavenly Father, gets to be with every one of his children, every person on earth at the same time because he's omnipresent. He's everywhere present at the same time. So what do you think the father would want me to tell you he said about his son, Jesus? I actually wrote a couple of different drafts of this message. And then one day, I, Papa asked me to take a walk with him in a park downtown here in Lawrence, where I live, and to take my notebook. So I did. So we walked all the way around the park. I'm just listening to him. And he said, okay, sit down here on this bench. I'm going to talk and you write. So I did. And that ended up being what I'm going to share with you in this little three-part series. First of all, I do want to tell you, at least in my opinion, my understanding, how we can tell it's God that we're hearing from, or if we're actually hearing from a different spirit that might be opposed to God, or if we're just hearing our own thoughts. There are a few things that we do know for sure. The gospel is good news for everyone. So what we hear from God is always going to be good news, not bad news. Now, we also know that Jesus is the exact representation of God. So what we hear will never be contradictory to what Jesus is like. And what we hear from God will never contradict Scripture, the New Testament especially, because that's where Jesus is revealed. And he is the exact representation of God. Now, the Holy Spirit of Jesus does speak to us. And Jesus told us the night before he died, this is in John 14, 26. Jesus said, the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby, all of those are accurate words. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place, will represent me and act on my behalf. He will teach you all things, and he will help you remember everything that I've told you. So when you hear from the Holy Spirit, what you hear will never cause you to be angry or fearful or judgmental or be afraid or to worry. It will never drain you or confuse you or make you upset. Now, you will get angry when you hear from Jesus if you believe in an angry, legalistic, God that's going to punish you, that has to be appeased, when you hear from Jesus that God's not like that, you may tend to get angry. That can happen to religious people. I know. Also, here are some things that we know when we hear from God. The Holy Spirit will produce God's fruit in us, his qualities, his love for you, for everybody, his joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and mercy and understanding and healing. When you hear from the Holy Spirit of Christ, when you hear from the Holy Spirit of Christ, you'll feel good and right and warm. Your spirit will resonate with Christ's spirit. You'll know, you'll be assured, you will have wisdom and insight. Then, as you ask and cooperate with Jesus, as he lives his life in you, you'll start to experience the divine supernatural life of Christ himself. And everybody around you will see you living the Christ life and they'll be attracted to Jesus. Now, I wanna share one other thing with you before I, uh, go on and tell you what Papa actually told me to say. I want to share some thoughts with you from a friend of mine from Atlanta, whose name is Richard Murray. Richard Murray asked this. He says, do you ever feel baffled 
by what exactly makes up the gospel message? How do we describe it? How do we share it? Most of all, how do we live it? The Apostle Paul said the gospel was so simple, yet it remains veiled to the eyes of many. What exactly is the gospel message that is being veiled? Well, the answer might shock you. 1 John 1, 5 says, this is the message we've heard from him and announced to you. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. The gospel is the good news of a good God. There's nothing bad in God. James wrote this in James 1, 17. Only good and perfect gifts come down from the Father of lights. See, God never gives us jagged stones of condemnation or serpent bites of affliction or scorpion stings of sickness. Luke writes in chapter 11, verse 11 to 15, he said, instead, the Father always and only gives us blessings of daily bread and beneficial fish and nourishing eggs. Jesus is the personification of his Father's light. His bright nature, his illuminating character, and his luminous of love. To receive the gospel of Jesus is to receive the indwelling light and love of God. So how is this wonderful gospel veiled to the eyes of so many? Why can't we see it? Well, again, the answer is shocking. The gospel is veiled by our own inner wrath, which causes us to project our own hate and hostility onto our image of God. We make God in our image. We then see God as the fickle dispenser of both good and evil, both love and hate, both inexhaustible forgiveness and unending wrath. This dualistic image of God makes him a nullity, an oxymoronic deity that makes no sense and never will. It just doesn't make sense. So if we have that mindset, we can think we're hearing from God when we hear hate and hostility and wrath and unforgiveness, but we're not. We're hearing our own image of what we would be like if we were God. Jesus said to see his father, we need only to see his son. Jesus explains and models a non-dualistic God. Jesus is the explanation of his heavenly father. God now makes perfect sense when you understand that. Perfect light and perfect love. Jesus is the gospel. All light, no darkness at all. In Matthew 4.10, Jesus gives his interpretation of Old Testament verses about fearing God. And quoting Deuteronomy, where it says in Deuteronomy, you shall fear the Lord your God. Jesus says that in Matthew 4.10. He changes it to you shall worship the Lord. So in the mind of the only one who truly knew the Father, fearing God meant the all the act of, of awe and worshiping someone so incredibly good that joyful delight could be the only genuine response to a relationship with God. Jesus delights in the Father. The Father delights in Jesus. You too are delighted in by the Father, being in the perfect humanity of the Son, and you're delighted in by the Son, being in the complete divine union with the Father. So right smack dab in the middle of all that joyful delight between the Father and the Son going on is you. You are getting delighted in from every possible direction. The waves of Trinitarian joy are just washing over your inner person in each and every moment. You're literally being joyed to life. Isn't that much better than living scared to death? You won't hear things from God that cause you to be scared or to fear. Jesus said the night before he died in John 16, 12 to 14, he said, I still have so many things to speak to you, but you can't bear them now. However, when the Holy Spirit comes, the spirit of truth, He'll guide you into all truth. He won't speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He said he will glorify me. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. See, we know we're hearing from God when what we hear glorifies Jesus. The Holy Spirit always reminds us of what we've already received from God, never what we need to do to try to get God to bless us. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, Now we have received... Not the spirit of the world. There are spirits in the world that speak to us, but we've received the spirit who is from God so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. In Jesus' words, the Holy Spirit has come to take all that is his and declare it to us. Now I want you to see something about that word we translate declare. 
It comes from the Greek ananeglio, which means, that comes from ana, which means up and finishing a pro project, and aglio means to declare. So the word means to declare a finished product all the way up. The Holy Spirit's ministry in your life, according to Jesus, is to, to declare to you your finished salvation in Jesus Christ all the way up from where you are, maybe at the bottom run, all the way up into your fully matured standing in Christ in the heavenly places. So no matter if you're a brand new Christian, if you're a baby in Christ, or if you're a mature believer, all you're ever going to hear from the true spirit, the spirit of Christ that's in you, is that you are a new creation in Christ. You're moving up more and more and more and experiencing more and more and more of your perfect condition in him. What a friend to have. What an encourager. What a comforter. So when you hear from God, it will always be encouraging and comforting and affirming, never condemning. Not only is the Holy Spirit personal, but he is the vital energy and dynamic of life that causes things under his activity to live and grow and develop and increase and vitalize and renew and regenerate and awaken and germinate and flourish with God's life. Both the Hebrew and Greek words in the Bible for spirit mean breath, wind, motion, movement, vitality, and by implication, life and energy. So the Holy Spirit of Christ in us is the Son's own breath, life, motion, movement, and vitality in us. Everything you need for your soul is in the sun breath inside of you. The spirit is the very motion and energy and vitality of the son of God living within you and bringing you into an experiential history of your perfections in him. His motions and flow and movement and intuition and thoughts and feelings are the dynamics where you live the life of Christ in you by his life. It's the life of grace experienced. So what we hear from God will always produce life. It will always be grace giving and grace producing. When we hear from God, what we hear will always lift up and promote Jesus, who he is and what he's already done for us, for us, what he's already done for us. All right. That's the end of the first part of our little three part message. Next time we'll continue on. Thanks for watching.